And this is, is particularly important, as I mentioned later, when we come to, to look at the impacts of stocking. Without going into to too much basic genetics, we can consider the heritability of each of these quantitative traits. It's the proportion of the variation that is genetically caused as opposed to environmentally caused. Something like growth rate has a, has a relatively low genetic component, about 20% genetics. Whereas if we turn to most aspects of, of reproduction, about 80% genetics, 20% environment, and becoming a sea trout is about 50-50. And one way we can get round this problem of trying to disentangle genetic and environmental influences is to carry out experiments under communal conditions. So we can take trout of different types, we can put them into a, a communal situation so all are experiencing the same environment and therefore any differences that we see must be due to genetic differences. And many of the results I'm going to be talking about shortly derive from such experiments. <clears throat> now don't worry about the, the detail here. I'm just looking quickly at an example of uh, a direct study of uh, DNA uh, variation. And this involves um, one particular gene system uh, that's been looked at in, in over 100 trout populations in Britain and Ireland. We've got some uh, 28 populations shown here. And I just want to basically illustrate a couple of, of points with this. Each colour on there, and you won't be able to discern them all, represents one of 26 different gene variants that exists. Now, if you look at most of these populations, which are rep each population is represented by a circle, you'll see that most have several colours. That is, there is variation occurring within the population. But also, look, look up here in northeast Scotland, you'll see that populations have very different colours. And so there is genetic variation among the population. And these two aspects, within population and among population, are not connected. And it's very important to uh, differentiate them. And some of the, uh, the, the problems that have arisen over an understanding of the genetic material uh, arise because people don't uh, differentiate between these, these two aspects. Of the 26 variants, 12 are found only in a, in a single population in each case. The other 14 are found in several populations, but in different quantity or frequency. And this is typically what we find for lots of different genes. They either have unique gene variants in each population, or, or you have shared gene variants, but occurring at uh, different frequency. Another example there, just looking at a smaller scale, you can see the variation here within the, the Loch Awe system in Scotland. And I'm sure Eric will have some more examples uh, to show on this as well. <coughs> so what we see then within Britain and Ireland is extensive genetic variation within and among our trout populations. And this has arisen due to colonisation by several genetically distinct lineages after the last ice retreated some 14,000 years ago. Together with adaptation to the great variety of different environmental conditions that occur, as well as random changes uh, as well. So a lot of genetic variation there. Is, is this really of any importance or is it purely just of, of academic interest? As we've seen, there is a genetic component to all important fitness traits, survival, migration, reproduction, and so forth. And so genetic variation actually determines overall abundance. So we can't ignore genetic variation any more than we can ignore habitat and other aspects of environmental quality. 
And so effective management of trout populations requires a recognition and the conservation of the genetic diversity that exists in trout. Genetic diversity also results in variation in phenotype, and this results in the diversity of angling opportunity and interest. Indeed, for many people, one of the, the great, great things about trout is the enormous variability that, that occurs there in, in many different aspects. One of the reasons probably why trout has been so successful when transplanted to other regions of the, the world is because of the, the large genetic variability that it shows. It enables it to adapt to different conditions. And this same genetic variability is important to allow trout to continue to adapt to ever-increasing environmental changes and aspects such as, as global warming and new diseases coming in consequently. And finally, genetic diversity is, of course, an integral component of biodiversity. And there's a statutory duty uh, on the government to protect it as a result of the Rio Convention. And so the diversity we have there has arisen over the past two million years. And if we lose it, we won't regain it, at least not in a, a meaningful time period. So how do we manage uh, this genetic variation in order to conserve it? Well, there's very little we can do directly in an improvement sense. Most genetic management is really to avoid doing certain things. However, maintenance of genetic variation requires healthy, thriving populations. And so my, my simple rule of genetic management is basically to look after the habitat and the general environment and the trout and their genes will happily look after themselves. A genetically probably the most damaging thing that can be done to a native trout population is supplemental stocking with farm trout or trout of non-native origin. I'll focus primarily on, on farm trout but non-native trout have, have similar considerations as well, though not to the same degree. Now, farm trout are, of course, trout, widely different from native trout in a particular water body. Now, many farm strains are derived solely or partially from the original leaven stocks that were set up in the uh, latter part of the 19th century and based very much on, on Loch Leven trout. And there were also imports at that time and slightly earlier from the, the continent. So a lot of the farm strains have been, have been set up from, from these sources. A few have been set up from, from local sources, but not, not very many. So this means that in most cases, when farm trout are stocked into a water, they're non-native to that, that water. Because it's much easier when you're setting up a farm strain to take from an existing domesticated stock than go out into the wild, there's been a lot of interchange among farm strains, even though many of the current owners aren't aware of it. But it results in most farm strains being genetically very similar. If you take any animal into culture, you inevitably get domestication because the culture environment is very different from the, the wild environment. And we have to remember this doesn't take a lot of time. It can occur even within a, a single generation. But of course, the more generations in captivity, the greater that domestication effect becomes. 